morning. Happy Sabbath. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis chapter 3. We will be looking at verses 1 through 10. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, to make one wise, hmm, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Thank you, Brother Steve. Appreciate that. Lovely, lovely music. Happy Sabbath, church. It's good to be in the house of God, amen. We all survived Nestor. Amen. Consider yourselves fortunate. We survived. I uh, received many phone calls, actually, from many a concerned member about the safety of uh, our city and even about the possibilities of, of uh, not having our service today. So, praise God. Uh, the devil was not able to. Uh, the, was, the devil was not able to beat us. So we're here. We're excited. But um, I'm not gonna lie. After this Hurricane Michael, um, uh, you know, situation, it seems like any little thing is we're kind of extra, right? Have you noticed that we're kind of extra paranoid, <laughs> extra careful. So um, it's good to. It's just good to know that the Lord protected us through this one too. This morning, we're going to continue our series on uh, the Sabbath. We've been studying a very interesting subject, which is foundational to us as Seventh-day Adventists, but uh, maybe we probably have addressed uh, different perspectives on the Sabbath that you may not have been exposed to. So that's our prayer, that we could look at the Sabbath maybe with new eyes, with a fresh look. Uh, before we jump in, though, we just wanted to remind everybody that tonight, or this evening, at 5.30 p.m., 5.30 p.m. for our Vespers, we're going to continue our series with Pastor Brian Denise on Reflections on the Gospel. How many of you have come and heard one of Pastor Denise's presentation? Okay. You, if you come, you need to put your seatbelts on, Okay. Because Pastor Denise, he's a, he's a, he's a firecracker. <laughs> a lot of powerful things have been addressed, and um, I think that you won't regret it. So please be here at 530, and uh, it's our second to the last presentation. It's a series of five presentations, and this um, evening will be uh, presentation number four. So please come. You will not um, regret it. Before we begin, I invite all of us to bow our heads as we have our prayer. Father, we're so thankful that, as the song said, that you are the great I am, that you are the Lamb. Father, this morning we want to thank you for sparing us from another inconvenience related to the storm. We pray for those 
that were not as fortunate as we were. And we ask, Lord, that you be with those that are without power at the moment. Father, help us to never be out of spiritual power, however. Help us to always be tapped into the source of uh, love, the source of revival, and the source of inspiration. At this moment, we invite your presence with us as we open our minds and as we take a look at your word. Give us wisdom from on high so that we can digest and internalize the message that you would have us hear. This is our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. Well, as we mentioned, our series is entitled, The Sabbath, A Date with God. Some of you may just now be tuning in. We're going to do a little review. This is our third uh, part of a uh, undisclosed uh, number uh, part series. We're not sure how long this will, this will take us, but we want to take our time. We don't want to be rushed, but we do want to take a look at the Sabbath because the further um, into this beautiful teaching we go, I think the more effective will be. In our part one, we presented um, the fact that the Sabbath has two powerful, has two powerful, there we go. Thank you, Eric has two powerful points, right? Number one, we said that, first of all, we said that the two most important questions we need to ask in our life is the question of origin and the question of destiny, okay? What did we say the question of origin was? Those of you that were here with us. The question of origin addresses what question? Where do I come from? Yes? And we're not talking about where were you born, right? (laughs) We're not saying where uh, does Ancestry.com put you as far as people. Okay? We're going deeper. Where do we come from as a human race? Right? What is the foundation of life? Uh, How do we get here, et cetera? This is the question of origin. And we also said that the other question that was just as important, is the question similar, but the question of destiny. And this question asks what? Where am I going? Okay? So the two questions is question one, where do I come from? And question two, where am I going? Okay? These may seem like very elementary uh, kindergarten type questions because don't... uh, Don't be mistaken, kindergartners sometimes are the best philosophers in life, okay? They ask some of the most foundational questions that make adults kind of uncomfortable, okay? Because that may be because there's a certain level of innocence and because uh, there's uh, multiple different things about a child that they're not afraid of addressing certain things, whereas those of us that are older, for whatever reason, we may be a little bit more shy asking certain questions. So even though it's a basic question, it's a question that philosophers and people in high levels, high ranks of academia are wrestling with today, okay? All of us have been exposed to multiple different theories about where do we come from, but the reason why we're addressing these two questions is because the Sabbath, the seventh day, the day our date with God, the day that God set aside is there to remind us where we come from, and it's also to remind us where we are going. Because maybe if we know where we come from, and maybe we we know where we're going, we may have a more focused and better quality of life present. Amen? If we come from God and we're going to God, maybe we'll live life in the now for God. And this is what the Sabbath does, is it reorients our journey in life. It reminds us that we're not an accident. It reminds us that we're not here by chance. And it also reminds us that after death, that is not the end. Amen? As the naturalists and some of the different thinkers of our day like to say, that when you're dead, that's pretty much it. You're done. It's over. Game over. But we know that there's more, there's more to that because of what the Bible tells us. So the Sabbath points us back to these beautiful posts, the past 
and the future, and that inevitably influences the present. That was part one. Part two, we talked about the Sabbath is not just a day that takes us to, back to a, geo, uh, uh, a uh, timeline, the past or the present, but we also saw that the Sabbath presents to us a person, right? Because if the Sabbath is a date, a date is important, but it's only important because usually a date involves what? Another person, what we call significant other, correct? So what we saw is that the Sabbath is essentially that. A sa- the Sabbath is a special day, a special time, are you ready? To be with a special someone, amen? <laughs> and according to Scripture, who is that special someone? It is God. We saw in our second presentation that the Sabbath presents a powerful God. A God who has the ability of creating something out of nothing. And if God has that ability in the book of Genesis, if he has the, that ability in the first chapter of the Bible that talks about creation, the fact that he spoke things into existence, he spoke things out of nothing, then that must mean that he can speak things that do not exist in my life into existence. Amen? What are certain things that he can, that he can speak? Patience. Thank you, Eric. Some of us don't have patience. Amen? <laughs> Forgiveness. Wow. Some of us don't have a forgiving heart. So we have to go to God. And you know what? You know the beautiful thing is that? You could come to God as empty as a bucket and say, Lord, speak things into existence in my life. Speak patience. Speak forgiveness. Speak humility. Amen? How about appreciation or gratitude? Yeah? And we could, we could go on and on, as you can see. The reason why the Sabbath is so special is because it points us back to a God who has the ability of doing things that we cannot do. The Sabbath points us to a powerful God. Number two, the Sabbath also points us to a personal God. A God that is all-powerful, but in spite of his all-power, it doesn't keep him away at a distance from us icky, problematic, dysfunctional creatures. Amen? God is not afraid of us. He's not afraid of our dark history. He's not afraid of the things that are destructive that are inside of us. And we know that because of the incarnation. He came and he basically became one of us. And that's something that for eternity we're still going to try to figure out. Amen? So the Sabbath points us back to a personal God who decided to set time to engage with his creation, to engage Adam and Eve. If God wasn't a personal God, and if he was just a thoughtful God, he would have created the Sabbath for Adam and Eve. Enjoy. And gone to the other side of the universe. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that the Sabbath was there so that they could commune together. Amen? So God could interact and have fellowship with his creation. It communicates and it presents a personal God. Powerful God, personal God. And the final thing that we learned in our previous presentation is that the Sabbath points us to a pledged God. What that means is that not only is he powerful, not only is he personal, but he's committed to you and I. So much so that he decided to dedicate the crowning act of his creation, which was the creation of Adam and Eve, as a celebration together on the seventh day Sabbath to perpetuate uh, the celebration not only of God's power, but of the fact that we were created. So God is committed to us as a people. And if he's committed to us, if he has pledged himself to us, maybe he's worthy of committing to 
he's worthy of making pledges. So this is what the Sabbath does. It presents us to the past, the future, and it shows us three beautiful characteristics of God. But ladies and gentlemen, the Sabbath does so much more than just that. And we're going to take a look at that. So we've learned in our scripture reading that unfortunately, the very good of creation became compromised and became assaulted. There was an invasion that occurred, and sadly, the very good became the not so good. Genesis chapter 3, if you're there, please say amen. Genesis chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Pause. By the way, this is the first question that we have in all of Scripture. Did you know that? First question. And the very first question that we have in Scripture is a question in order to create doubt on the character of God. It's supposed to kind of create confusion as to whether he is arbitrary or not. Has God really said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, let me ask you a question. Is that question true or false? It's false. Because God didn't say that. What was it that God said? God said the opposite. He says you can eat up every single one of them except one. Isn't it interesting? What would we call what would we call that attribute of God allowing the consumption of 99.9999999 trees in the garden of Eden which by the way we don't have any data in scripture to tell us anything close to the quantity I could imagine that there were millions just because why not right <laughs> It's the garden of Eden But there was one tree that they were not supposed to eat. What, what does that teach us about God in his relationship with his children? And this takes a lot of, this is a powerful thing now because I'm a parent now. I'm a father. So I'm, still, I'm on training wheels. Be patient with me, right? But this is teaching us about parenting, right? What is God doing with Adam and Eve when he says, hey, listen, you guys can eat of all of this, but... This, little, this one over here, eh, you don't, just don't mess with it. What does it teach us about God? Okay, so God has got a boundaries, but if you look at the percentages, if you look at the nu numerical difference be between what we are allowed to do and what we are not allowed to do, what does that teach us about God? Say that one more time. Did you guys hear that? God gives us exponentially more than he restricts. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that beautiful? By the way, a religion, okay, listen, a religion that emphasizes and focuses and concentrates 99.99999 on everything you can't do, amen, everything you're not supposed to do, everything you ought to do, you got to put a question mark and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this really reflecting the character of God? Amen? By the way, not only your religion, let's talk about our witnessing and our evangelism. Amen? <laughs> How effective is our witnessing and our evangelism going to be when we are basically following an approach that is contrary to God in the Garden of Eden? Where we talk about all of the things that we can do, and then we mention kind of a footnote about the two or three things that we're allowed to do. You guys follow? You guys catching what I'm throwing? I see a lot of silent people. I think, we're, I think we're, we're touching on a sensitive issue here. You guys follow, right? God is not a God of, you know, running around with, a, with sirens, trying to, that's not, first of all, that's not appealing, yes? Second of all, that's not effective. I mean, think about it. If God is using this approach to Adam and Eve, 
it makes sense why Satan is trying to twist it. Because he knows that Adam and Eve will, listen, this is a bold statement, will forever be faithful to God when they know that his goodness and his generosity is exponentially higher and larger and grander than his restrictions. Adam and Eve, they're in it for life. They are pledged for life. So what does he do? Has God really said that you're not allowed to eat of every tree of the garden? Eve is like, what? This, this is backward information. You see, Satan didn't, didn't start off by saying God is a liar, right? Because that would have been too obvious. And her, her alarms would have been set off. So the devil decides to be a little sneaky. And he starts asking a question that, at least to her brain, is obviously uh, the answer to that question is an obvious no. But what the question does is it invites and it incites, please enlighten me. Has God really said that you're, oh, you see that? He's kind of just dazzling her in to conversation. And when you are in conversation with Satan himself, ladies and gentlemen, you're in a bad situation because you, you, cannot, you cannot overwit the devil. Amen? He's way too cunning. So the Bible tells us that the serpent presents the first question, and the question is creating doubt to the concept that God is exponentially more generous in his generosity than in his restrictions. So now, if you read verse 2 and onward, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, what? You will not surely die. See, now he's a little bit more aggressive because he's, he's got her, right? She bit the bait. Verse 5. And then he starts developing a very dangerous theology that goes totally foreign and contrary to what she knows about God. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What was the serpent's, and of course we know that the serpent is being, we know who the serpent is, right? It's this fallen angel. What was the ambition and the insatiable desire of this fallen angel when he was in heaven. To have the authority of God, to be like God, to take his position, and now what he's doing is he's projecting that desire on others. He's projecting that to Eve, right? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. This is very important. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, Genesis 1 and 2 are very different than Genesis 3. All of a sudden, the temperature changed, right? The climate changed. The relationship changed. In fact, if you look in the screen, you'll see the experience of Adam and Eve before falling into the serpent's charm and after they fell into the serpent's charm. What happened before? What was the reality of the Garden of Eden before? Well, the Bible says that the man and his wife were both naked and they were what? Not ashamed. Chapter 2, verses 25. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. Chapter 1, verse 31, and the Lord, good, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to fill it and to keep it. Chapter 2, verse 15. In other words, before the Genesis 3 deception, man 
was naked and felt no shame. What does this mean? This means that before Genesis 3, the Garden of Eden was such an environment where it was a safe place to be in a vulnerable position. It was a safe place to show your true colors. It was a safe place to be transparent on who you really are. There, it was a place with no shame. It was also a place that was very good, and that's obviously an understatement. And it was a place where Adam and Eve had a special uh, function and a special role. The Garden of Eden was created for Adam and Eve. It was theirs. Now, what happened after Genesis 3? What happened after the deception of Genesis 3? Well, let's take a look at the screen. After, in chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, The eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Before they were naked and not ashamed, after they were naked, and then what are they trying to do, according to the text? They're trying to cover themselves. If they're trying to cover themselves, which is a symptom, what is the root issue? They feel shame. All of a sudden, they go from a reality of no shame to a reality of shame. And when, you're sh when you feel ashamed, what is the first thing you want to do? You want to hide. You want to cover up. Okay? This is what's going on in Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 17 and 19, the Bible says that cursed is the ground because of you. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of a sudden, the very good experience of everlasting life in close communion with God, eating of the precious fruit, all of a sudden became a place where you're going to experience cursed grounds, you're going to go back to the dust, and unfortunately, the very good is the not so good. And then finally, we see after the fall that the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim, an angel, and a flaming sword turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, that seems a bit, a bit barbaric, some would say. Why is it that God is, why did God kick out Adam and Eve? And why is he putting a big angel with a flaming sword? I mean, come on. I thought God was a God of love. I thought God was a God of mercy. What's that all about? Come on, saints. What are your thoughts? Why is God removing Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden? And why is he putting a bodyguard <laughs> to keep? Why is he keeping security? So that they can't what, Steve? Why not? What's the concern about eating the tree of life? Because if they have access to the tree of life and they eat it, what happens to sin? It becomes a perpetual problem and sin becomes immortalized. So God, because he's a good God, amen? Because he's a merciful God, because he's a gracious God, he removes Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden for their own protection. So now they go from the Garden of Eden to the badlands of life. And the Garden of Eden is protected. Now, why are we talking about the Garden of Eden? Why are we talking about the fall? I thought this series was about the Sabbath. Because remember, the Sabbath is in the context of a conflict. And the conflict is really, if you kind of Peel back all the layers of the onion at the core. The conflict is over. Is God really who he says he is? Now, why is the Sabbath so important? Well, because if we have an understanding of that God created us and that God is going to restore everything, if we understand that God is powerful, if we understand that God is personal, if we understand that God is pledged, we're probably going to have a higher chance of having a correct understanding of the character of God if we're experiencing the blessing of God via the Seventh-day Sabbath. You follow? Now, this is the problem, though. Adam and Eve have just been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. 
even though they don't have the privilege of having that close, uninterrupted connection with God anymore, God has to think of how to keep Adam and Eve in tune with his hearts, even though they're out of tune when it comes to Garden of Eden citizenship. They're no longer residents of the Garden of Eden. So how is God going to keep the heart of Adam and Eve and all future generations connected to his heart, connected to pre-Genesis 3 relationship? What does he do? By the way, God is a genius, amen? God does what only God would think of. (laughs) He decides, along with the eviction notice, Amen? To give Adam and Eve an envelope. And in this envelope, the bad news and the good news are both stipulated. The bad news is that you have to move out. You got to get out of the Garden of Eden. Sorry. It's for your own good. But the good news is also stipulated. The good news, Adam and Eve, even though you can no longer live in the Garden of Eden, you are going to have with you two realities, two gifts from the Garden of Eden, and you're going to take it with you away from the Garden of Eden. While you're running through the badlands of the world, while you're dealing with the cursed grounds, while you're having to labor in childbirth, in pain, while you're having to have the sweat of your brow, while you're dealing with the survival of the fittest post-Garden of Eden, I am going to give you two things that came from the Garden of Eden to keep you connected to my heart. And what was the first thing that God gave them? Well, number one, what God didn't do is give them divorce papers. Amen? Amen? The first marital counseling that occurred is in Genesis 3. Did you know that? Because what happened when it came time to address issues? God came to Adam. And by the way, he asked Adam three questions. Right? Three questions. What did Adam essentially do? He basically blamed his wife. (laughs) I wish we could say, this is a foreign practice. Right, husbands? What was he thinking? I've never thought of doing that. Right? God asks him three questions, and he kind of dishes it off. He's like, (laughs) I mean, listen, she... He's trying to kind of give that, 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 that. He's trying to basically cast the blame and transfer it to his wife. Asks Adam three questions. And then he shifts gears, God, and approaches the wife and asks her not three questions, one question. Now, a lot of scholars like to have fun with this. And there actually may be some truth to this, even though there's some humor about this. Some scholars say that the reason why God had to ask Adam three questions is because it takes us men, amen, a little bit longer to figure things out, right? And uh, even though that may be the case, there's still a lot of conjecture on that. It's also because at the end of the day, Adam was the responsible person, right? If you read the New Testament, you will discover that Adam wasn't deceived. Eve was deceived. Remember he... She came into the dazzle and the charm of the serpent. Now, that doesn't say that she's completely off the hook, right? Because she was deceived. But it's probably less of a violation if you commit sin under deception than if you commit sin knowing that it's a sin. Amen? You follow? So the problem with Adam is that he wasn't deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was getting himself into. Eve, not so much, because she was under the spell of the serpent. Again, doesn't mean that one is more guilty than the other, but it shows that God held Adam more accountable. That's why he asked him three questions. He asks Eve one question. And of course, Eve, being sneaky as well, what does she do? 
with the blame. Serpent. Interestingly enough, he asks Adam three questions. Asks Eve one question. Asks the serpent zero questions. Isn't that interesting? God does not enter into negotiations with the serpent. Why? Well, because God is a lot smarter than we are. Amen? We enter into negotiations with the serpent all the time on a daily basis. God knows that that's, there's no point. So what he does is he pronounces judgment on the serpent. You follow? So what you have here is a, pre, there's a premarital counseling. It's basically well, postmarital counseling, you say, because they were married earlier. So even though now, unfortunately, Adam and Eve's relationship with God has changed. They're running away from him, okay, <laughs> instead of going to him. There's the first emotion ever in the Garden of Eden of fear, okay? This was foreign. Fear was not a, a, a normal thing that you felt in the Garden of Eden. So there's a lot of new, very powerful uh, emotional realities that Adam and Eve are experiencing as a result of sin. That has changed the DNA of their relationship, not only with God, but as we can see in Genesis 3, it also has changed the DNA of their relationship with themselves. Okay? So God says, listen, you're not going to survive. We can't keep you in the Garden of Eden because you guys are a liability to yourself. We're going to have to get you out of the, the Garden of Eden. How do we keep you in the straight and narrow? Ding. I'm going to give you two things that's going to keep you connected to my heart and is going to keep you connected to the Garden of Eden. The first thing is marriage. The marriage covenant, the marriage ceremony that we have established here in the Garden of Eden, you're going to keep it throughout the future generations. Those that are happily married should say amen. <laughs> Amen, right? Because marriage is a blessing, amen? It's a challenge. It has days where it's like, is it really a blessing, right? But it's a blessing. And it's a blessing, of course, even more if you are experiencing marriage in the Garden of Eden, amen? We're not in the Garden of Eden, as you can tell. So marriage is a little trickier now. There's terms and conditions in order to survive it requires a little bit more uh, paperwork. There's more documents you have to read because now we are unfortunately products of sin. We're fallen. We're selfish. And in order to carry out a marriage, we're two people that are totally different, not just in physiology, but even mentally, you need an extra dose of God, amen, in order to carry that out. So God says, okay, man and woman, they need marriage for themselves. But check this out. God is such a genius. Man and woman, in order for them to have a successful marriage, they need me. So God says, how do I keep humanity connected to me outside of the Garden of Eden? I'll give them marriage. Because they can't survive without me. It'll force them to get to their knees. Say, Lord, I can't stand this man. Of course, our ladies in our church have no idea what I'm talking about, obviously. Right? Marriage is what, what some have called a sanctification booster. Amen? It's a sanctification pressure cooker. It gets you there faster. <laughs> Amen? God says, how are we going to keep Adam and Eve and all of the sons and grandchildren of Adam and Eve connected to me if they're no longer in the Garden of Eden? We're going to give them two gifts. Gift number one is marriage. And we all know that marriage is beautiful and sweet. But again, since it's an institution that was created by God in the Garden of Eden, in order for it to last, it requires his presence at its core. If you're the devil, what are you going to do to this Eden-created covenant that keeps humanity connected to God. What are you going to do to this beautiful covenant that comes from the Garden of Eden? How? How do you attack it? Okay. 
you corrupt it. And how do you do that? The same thing that the serpent did to the woman in the concept of God's generosity versus his restrictions on what they were allowed to do, he goes to marriage and he starts creating this twilight zone, confusion. And he basically attacks what marriage is supposed to be. Amen. And the candidates within marriage, without getting into details. Amen. Amen. God has a particular blueprint <laughs> on how, ma- what ma- how marriage is supposed to work. If you're the devil, what do you do? You go back to the drawing board and you create your own blueprints. Yes? This is what we're facing today. And this is why it's a problem. But not only did God give marriage, he also gave, what else? The seventh day Sabbath. These two things after you leave the Garden of Eden, will keep you connected to me. That was interesting. Another scholar said something very powerful. He says, listen, why the Sabbath, why marriage? He says the marriage and the Sabbath are very similar. Ah, you know, I, I thought this was interesting. I, 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 I probably have to think about this a little bit more. It kind of does make sense, though. He says marriage is a unit of two very different people. Correct? That's an understatement. And he said the Sabbath is a unit. What's the unit? A unit of time. 24-hour period of time. But that's made up of what? The evening and the morning. Two very different times of the day. Isn't that interesting? The day obviously has a different, I mean, you know, the sun is shining, etc., and then the night has also a different tone. Now, he didn't specify which was which, thankfully. Amen? <laughs> I have an idea <laughs> what that may be like. But the Sabbath and marriage are both units that involves two different uh, perspectives that are very different, but they're not necessarily against each other. Man and woman are very different, but it doesn't mean they have to be against each other. Amen? Day and night are very different, but it doesn't mean they have to be against each other. They're two units totally. I thought that was kind of interesting. I'm still chewing on that. So now they're out of the Garden of Eden, and they're dealing with the aftermath of their rebellion. They have marriage, and they have the Sabbath. All throughout the prophets, all throughout Scripture. In fact, if you have your Bibles, go quickly to the book of Isaiah. If you're you're there in in, the... Genesis, run, run forward to the book of Isaiah real quick. Isaiah chapter 11, all throughout, from Genesis all the way to, to Matthew. All the, the Old Testament in particular, the prophets are giving us echoes, echoes of the Garden of Eden, reminding us of what we lost, reminding us of the fact that the paradise is no longer here with us. In Isaiah chapter 11, if you're there, please say Amen. Beginning in verse 6, the prophet Isaiah, this is one of many examples, not only in Isaiah, but all over the Old Testament, where the prophets are taking our minds to the paradise lost. Verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with what? Two totally different beings, right? Two units. Now, we would argue that they don't go together. They don't go together after the fall, but before the fall they did. The leopard shall lie down with what? The young goats, the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Goodness gracious. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Are you listening? They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Many other texts we could read, we don't have the time. All throughout the Old Testament, we have echoes of the Eden that we lost, paradise lost. Look at all these things that were beautiful that we don't have anymore. We've lost it. We've lost it. 
But the prophets are not there to just play a sad song. We've lost the Garden of Eden. They're also there to teach us that this paradise that has been lost will be a paradise that we will experience once again. Amen? And the only way we will experience it is if we stay close to God in between paradise lost and paradise found. And the two things that God has given us, the two gifts from the Garden of Eden, is marriage and the Sabbath, both of which are highly relational experiences because that's the fundamental issue that we've lost is the ability to have healthy relationships. That explains why first century Jesus came into the world and the church was not, you follow? Because it wasn't all about doctrine necessarily. It was about how to relate to God through that doctrine. Does that make sense? Did they have the right information? Almost, right? 90%, you could argue, that they had a lot of the right information. The problem is that they didn't have the right relationship with God. Therefore, they couldn't relate with the Gentiles. So God had to fix that. Marriage, the Sabbath, two powerful platforms for healthy relationships. If you look at the screen, Genesis 3 tells us that God's presence evoked fear. This is after the fall. There was curse on the ground. They were cut off from the tree of life, and that ultimately they will return to dust. Okay? Check, check the other category. Revelation 21 through 22, which is essentially the Garden of Eden restored. And look at, look at how every single part is a complete counterpart of what we've lost. Seeing God's face without fear. Isn't that unreal? Genesis 3, they, 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 saw, they heard God's presence, they ran. The Bible says that in Revelation 21, 22, we're going to see God's face and we're not going to have any fear. That's something worthy of Sabbath afternoon uh, marinating and chewing on, right? Can you imagine that, seeing the face of Almighty God and not having one drop of fear? Wow, that's precious. That's precious. No more curse. The curse was on the earth. The Bible says that there will be no more curse. We were cut off from the tree of life. Well, we're going to be given access to the tree, Revelation 22, verse 2. And we were going to return to dust after Genesis 3. Uh, Revelation 21, 4 says there will be no more death. So what we see in the entire book of the Bible is in the beginning we have paradise lost. In the end of the Bible we have paradise lost found. If you want to add a, another fascinating book to your library, you need to get this book, The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day. I'm going to be quoting this book throughout our entire series. The thing is unreal. Quote, page 49, from innocence to guilt. It's talking about the transfer of going from the Garden of Eden to post-Genesis 3 fall. From innocence to guilt, from intimacy to to alienation, from confidence to fear, from happiness to grief, from life to death, from access to the tree of life to being barred from the garden. And by the way, if you want to know what the future holds and what prophecy unfolds, is the opposite. Amen? We could read the exact same statement and read it backwards. Going from being barred from God, we're given access to the tree of life. Going from death to life, from grief to happiness, from fear to confidence, from alienation to intimacy, from guilt to innocence. This is what God has in store for every single one of us. And in the meantime, in order to survive and not go crazy, amen? In order to not throw in the towel. In order to stay in the straight and narrow. In order to not be bedazzled by the serpent's enticing temptations. In order to stay connected to God. In order to not forget the goodness of God, he says, I'm gonna give you two gifts. Here's marriage. Here's the Sabbath. These two things are gonna keep you in the straight and narrow. It's gonna be hard, They're a blessing, but 
They're demanding. Amen? Amen? They're demanding. They require sacrifice. Do they? Does the Sabbath in marriage require sacrifice? Yes. Does it always require you to evaluate yourself? Yes. But even though they ask of us certain things, they give us way more in return. Amen? And the reason why that is is because at its core, marriage and the Sabbath, God is at its core. How many of you today, as you're going through the badlands of your spiritual journey, some of us have never experienced what it means to live in the Garden of Eden, but we can, by faith, have a foretaste of what the Garden of Eden was through these two blessings that God has given us. How many of you want to say, Lord, by the raising of my hand, I want to experience the Garden of Eden, paradise restored now. (laughs) He says you can through the Sabbath and through healthy, committed relationships. Amen? How many of you want to say, Lord, help me to have a committed relationship with you and a healthy, committed relationship with each other? Amen?